most of our national currencies like dollars and euros, etc., they're fiat. They have value by decree because the government said so. So Bitcoin wanted to replicate that in that it had free market value. Just citizens in the world valued it in and of itself because it was valuable if they could find a way to do that when they created Bitcoin. And history shows us that they certainly did. The world faces peak gold according to Goldman Sachs, but one geologist who's discovered more than 30 million ounces of gold says he knows where to find America's hidden gold deposits. Featured on the History Channel's How the Earth Was Made, this expert gold finder could be on the verge of a massive gold strike. Even a billion dollar gold giant has engaged this small market cap company to use their proprietary technology. For the thrill of gold discovery, with a new edge in Nevada, visit crushthestreet.com gold. Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amadori, and I'm joined today with Max Wright. Uh, he's a libertarian philosopher, and he's a blockchain thought leader, author, investor, and a, a successful internet entrepreneur. And he was an associate producer for the award-winning Bitcoin documentary uh, t entitled Bitcoin, the end of money as we know it. So we're definitely going to talk about Bitcoin, uh, some freedom discussions, and just pick his brain. So Max, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Max, uh, we've seen some volatility with Bitcoin as of lately. It, it went over the $400 mark. And uh, on my screen right now, we got it around uh, roughly th uh, $380. Um, I, I don't have it up, actually. <laughs> but I, last time I checked, it was like 385. Um, can you give us an update on what is going on with Bitcoin currently and just the infrastructure that is being built out that is making it a more viable option for people as money and for many people, uh, the, the money of choice? Sure. Uh, there's a lot of questions in there. So there, there's some, there's some, uh, a bit of a bombshell hit the Bitcoin industry about a week ago. Maybe we'll get to that in a second, and I'll answer the second part of your question first: is what is Bitcoin? Why is it so exciting? Why is that infra infrastructure being built out? And uh, and you know what what, what is it, what's its impact in the world uh, going to be? And the answer is so quick history here. Um, January of 2009, Bitcoin is released into the world after uh, a number of a small group of developers. And the primary one being uh, somebody who has yet to reveal their identity, known as Satoshi Nakamoto, has uh, basically chatted in the forums, brainstormed an idea to bootstrap a global currency, which is a pretty amazing thing in and of itself. But they, uh, they had an idea to create a currency that was completely disintermedi disintermediated from, all, from any human element. Meaning, you know, unlike the Federal Reserve, unlike the the um, you know the Bank of England and the the ECB and all these kinds of things, where every every time you're sitting on the edge of your chair waiting to see what some panel of human beings are going to decide what to do, are they going to decide to increase interest rates? Are they going to decide to do quantitative easing? And and everyone's waiting to see what humans are going to do. And uh, Bitcoin was designed to just be not any of that nonsense. It's uh, it grounded in what's called Austrian economics. And uh, it believes that the market should, be, it should dictate all of those terms and we should keep government's hands well away from anything to do with money. Now, an alternative, now, something like that already existed, of course, and that was precious metals and, and many other kinds of things as well. But there's a challenge. Those kinds of things um, are very easily controlled by government. In order for gold or silver to be useful as a as a money, you have to be able to um, you know walk through a a, a, um, a metal detector and, and not have government pick your pocket. You have to be able to send it off to a storage facility and you know let it be there. And then if I want to pay for my groceries, well then I just make an electronic payment and say transfer 0.7 grams of my gold into the name of the grocery store. But because there's all this gold at a storage facility, that means it's very easy for governments to confiscate, outlaw, eliminate, attack, etc. So Bitcoin had two primary focuses, replicate gold in the, in the spirit of being something that is, um, you know, there's not a, a group of wise men, it's not a dictate from government, and the term is fiat. Fiat currency, um, by, it's a Latin term, it means by decree. And you know, most of our national currencies like dollars and euros, etc., they're fiat. They have value by decree because the government said so. Um, so Bitcoin wanted to replicate that in that it had free market value. Just citizens in the world valued it in and of itself because it was valuable if they could find a way to do that when they created Bitcoin. And history shows us that they certainly did. 
The second thing it needed to do was it needed to be censorship resistant. Unlike gold and silver, where men with guns can come and confiscate the inventory from the, um, from the vaults, they needed something where men with guns were impotent towards uh, crippling it, destroying it, etc. And Bitcoin is that perfect junction, that perfect union between the two, where it's incredibly valuable, it's incredibly useful, it's scarce, just like uh, precious metals are, but it has this extra element of being censorship resistant. And the way they achieved that was they put it on the internet as an internet protocol and they did it they followed a model um, which was i guess was pioneered or by uh, something like like BitTorrent, whereby napster was shut down because there were it was able there was a, a file sharing system where that was shut down by the government so then napster was invented whereby instead of there being big servers somewhere that were managing this whole protocol what they did was they put uh, just millions of computers all over the world contributed a little bit of processing power to equal the processing power of the servers that, that used to exist. And so now to shut it down, you have to shut down well, every single computer on the planet in order to shut it down. Otherwise, it can't be shut down. And so that's how it, it, it achieved its level of censorship resistance. I've spoken for a long time there, but is that kind of yeah, encapsulate no, no, that, why Bitcoin is so important? That that's excellent. Uh, it it really shows uh, what the need because in, in a lot of ways, uh, especially over the last few years, with gold going from nineteen hundred down to where it is now, silver collapsing, there's been somewhat of a release for some people to experience, you know, an alternative to fiat currency, and of course, Bitcoin was uh, fit that. Uh, fit that for for many people what i i'm going to ask you this in sort of like a full disclosure sort of way uh what are you, what are the threats to bitcoin what what makes you nervous if anything about uh storing your money in bitcoin um there's there's several things I, I, and i'll answer them i just want to uh, address something that you just said because i think that's another kind of cool aspect of bitcoin um we, we all kind of know the stories around um, manipulation of gold prices and things like that. There, there's an abundance of material to suggest that that's happening and the big banks are behind it and they're being protected by governments. And there's um, a, a portion of the reason for that. It's, just a, it's not the entire reason, but there's a portion of the reason for that is that gold is a, a pain in the butt to deal with in and of itself. If you have it, you need to secure it and, and transport it. It's very heavy, so it's expensive. And so it's a lot easier to, to sell contracts for gold and silver rather than actually the gold and silver itself. But with Bitcoin, it's so easy to, to, to send the actual Bitcoin itself that there's less of a need to deal in paper contracts for Bitcoin rather than Bitcoin itself. And so there's less uh, paper Bitcoin floating around in, in, compared to the, you know, the proportion of actual Bitcoin. And I think that's one kind of aspect, which is yet another reason why um, Bitcoin is le has more censorship to resistance and price manipulation um, because there's more actual Bitcoin in, in the markets and less paper Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But now to your question, what are the threats of Bitcoin and, and what are the things that we should be wary of? And this, well, this kind of ties into um, you know, something that happened this week. Uh, one of the uh, primary developers of Bitcoin is just, and there's, a, there's lots of people who contribute to the Bitcoin network, but a gentleman by the name of Mike Hearn, he's a former Google employee, and uh, I think it's about five years ago or so, he quit his job at, at Google and he just went all in and dedicated all his time to the Bitcoin um, animal because he, he saw a huge potential in it and thought it was great. He recently came out and said, I'm walking away from the project. I think there's too many threats there. And uh, it's basically, I see that there's having fundamental flaws that um, are going to be the, the end of Bitcoin. Now, but the reason, and we'll get to his specific complaints in a minute, but the reason I brought him up and I, is he was one of the people that championed this, this idea at all times. And I really, really like Mike. He's a very, very smart guy. Every time you interviewed him, and I interviewed him a number of times, you can see on my YouTube channel, YouTube, uh, just such a contrarian dude. Um, he, he would always remind you that this is just an experiment. Bitcoin is an experiment. It doesn't have thousands of years of history of mon as being money like gold and silver does. Bitcoin is an experiment. We release it to the world. There's, it's going to have huge growing pains. If it does turn into a global currency, there are lots of things that have to change about it because in its current form, it won't be able to support the number of transactions needed. It won't be able to support hundreds of millions or billions of people in an ecosystem uh, transferring uh, money every single day. And so in order for it to get to where it needs to be, there are a lot of things that need to change. And there's, you know, untested mechanisms by which the community comes to consensus. Uh, so by that, I mean, 
Bitcoin is very much the people's money. It is owned and controlled by the community. There is no, there is no Fed. There is no committee of wise people who have ultimate power. It is a, it's a free market thing where lots of people, um, by their actions and by what they buy and by what they sell, that is what controls um, some of the things with regards to, to Bitcoin. And the community needs to accept Bitcoin and accept changes and proposals within Bitcoin. And they do that by voting with their dollars. So um, I'm voting, voting with their Bitcoin and voting with their mining power. And so these kinds of things, as Bitcoin, we know that Bitcoin needs to change. Between now and 20 years from now, Bitcoin absolutely needs to change. It's changed a hell of a lot already. In fact, I think there's only about one third of the original Bitcoin code that was released seven years ago. There's only one third of the original code left. Two thirds of that code has been updated and changed and whatever else. So we know Bitcoin changes. We know it has a consensus me mechanism. We know there's a way by which the community votes and champions changes to improve the protocol. But it's, you know, it's a relatively small experiment. So the question, the question that uh, Mike has always reminded, reminded us of is... You know, will Bitcoin be able to grow and scale and do all of the things that it needs to do within this consensus mechanism? And that's something that's certainly open for debate. And that's, I would say, one of the biggest threat vectors against Bitcoin. Max, uh, that's kind of, in a sense, what the argument is for why we went to fiat. Uh, people said that gold couldn't keep up with the changes, the, the growing population. Um, and uh, my own personal belief is gold uh, kept the governments in check and the governments couldn't do what they wanted to do in terms of spending. But uh, the argument in terms of it not being able to keep up with the infrastructure and for it to, you know, grow with the population, that, that's an interesting uh, point you brought up. And it's, it kind of reminded me of what I've heard people complain, uh, especially Keynesians who uh support fiat money say that hey we, we need fiat money because gold wasn't going to do its job with a growing economy uh, a growing infrastructure and more people and, and all those any thoughts on that yeah i think the keynesians are dead wrong on that with regards to gold and silver um gold and silver can be pulled out of the ground the more valuable it is i mean it's it's just a beautiful free market money if it becomes increasingly scarce then the price will go up and therefore there's greater incentive to go and mine more gold you know 10 20 times more gold than has ever been mined in the history of the world at the bottom of ocean floors it's just really expensive to go and get so i think the keynesians are dead wrong on that with regard to gold and silver um, but with regards to Bitcoin, that is a more valid argument in that the, the protocol does need to change in order to scale to billions of people. And whether or not it has what it takes to do so, that is a valid threat against Bitcoin. Hmm. Well, and so let's talk about this block size increase debate. Um, you know, for, for many of us who aren't 100% up to speed on this. Uh, can you give us a little of the history on this and why it's important and kind of what's going on within the, the Bitcoin community at the moment? Sure. So <clears throat> one of uh, Mike's chief complaints were that, it's, uh, first of all, this, this problem is caused by a very good thing. Um, the, the number of people using the Bitcoin network is growing and growing very strongly. And so people want to use Bitcoin. There is huge demand for it. And we are approaching a technical capacity of the, the Bitcoin blockchain in its current form. Um, the way it works is every 10 minutes, all of the transactions in all of the world is all bundled up and put into what's called a block. And there is a part of the protocol is that there is a limit on how big that block can be. And it's one megabyte at present. So, but that limit is a very arbitrary limit. Um, we could just change that to two megabytes and then we have doubled the capacity of the network. So, as we approach this limit, we're starting to see where people, are, if you make a transaction right now, it doesn't get in in the, the current block. You might have to wait two or three blocks to where there's a vacancy to where you can get your transaction put into the blockchain and recorded forever because of this technical uh, capacity. It's, it's, it's being eaten up by the sheer number of people that are being enthusiastic and wanting to use Bitcoin. So it's, it's a great problem to have. It just needs to be managed. And this is, it's not like it caught us by surprise. The Bitcoin community has known about this limitation for forever. The Bitcoin community knew it had to be solved. 
And as early as, you know, 12 months ago, nine months ago, the debate started to be getting um, really, really serious about this. And uh, some of the lead developers, Mike being one of them, put forward a solution, which um, they thought this is, you know, it's a pretty simple thing to do. Let's go ahead and, and change that block size limit from one megabyte to something else, be it 20 megabyte or 10 megabyte or two megabyte or something. So the why is it a problem, is, though? If, if, why is it a debate? Well, well, exactly. So that's where this is kind of, this is where uh, the consensus mechanism, mechanism is being called into question by Mike. Because what he perceived as a relatively obvious decision, uh, and certainly a good thing for the Bitcoin community, is, has not been embraced by the community at, at, at large. There are some elements within the Bitcoin community that say, we do not want, want this change, it's bad. Now, because of the nature of this this consensus mechanism, it's not a group, you know, 10 guys behind closed doors going to sit around a boardroom and there's one leader and they bully each other and, and usually come to an agreement. Usually they were selected because they have a similar like mind. And then they come out and they tell the entire world how it's going to be. This is a free market. It's a very democratic coin in that sense, in that there's millions and millions of participants and their consensus is important. And so arriving at a consensus with, when there's millions of participants, that's going to take a longer time. It's going to, um, it's, it's going to be harder and harder to a, arrive at that level of consensus. And so there's, all, there's, there's just different things. Should we raise the block size to 2 megabyte? Should we raise the block size to 4 megabyte? And some of the, the, um, the people who are against the, the change, they want to hold off against increasing the block size. Uh, it's been hypothesized by Mike. And I think that's true, that it's largely the Chinese community, um, and they, they're a very significant community in the Bitcoin world, because um, the Chinese government has limitations on their, uh, their throughput and because of their bandwidth, the larger the block size is, the bigger the disadvantage is to the Chinese community uh, when it comes to Bitcoin. And so he argues that it's largely the Chinese community that is resisting this change, and it's kind of this, this warring between two groups of people saying, no, let's change it. Yes, let's change it. But I think because of um, Mike's, let's call it a dummy spit, because of Mike's dummy spit, I think what's happened already in the last week is this, this Chinese community that, is hold, that was holding out, they've pretty much seen the, uh, the, the, the pressure that the rest of the world is putting on them and they're kind of coming to the table now and, and I think changes are going to happen rather soon. Now, it can be argued one of two ways. It can be argued that, well, this was a failure of the consensus mechanism, as Mike said, and uh, it's, it's highlighted a failure of the consensus mechanism and what, someone's going to have to spit the dummy and throw a tantrum and leave Bitcoin and the price is going to have to plummet 20% every time you want to make a change. Or the, the corollary is you can say, well, that's actually the market working really well. The, uh, you know, the arguments were debated. You know, the, 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 pers the, the group of people who wanted to make a, a certain change had to put pressure on the people who did want to make a change. And these are the kinds of things that's like, you know, it, it's not as simple as just handing out a decree. This is the market working and the ideas flowing through the system to arrive at a consensus. And yes, it caused a hiccup in the price, but that's actually a better system than waiting for an announcement from the Fed every month. So, I, I, you know, that's kind of where I was going to take it next. And it's this, again, it's my lack of understanding of the technicals in Bitcoin. But... The problem with fiat money is that it's controlled and the fact that Bitcoin can be changed and, and people have this control over it, isn't that a, a negative of Bitcoin? And I guess because I thought that Bitcoin was something that's kind of out there and it, it can't be touched, it can't be changed, it, it's, it's set in the motion and even the creator can't like go in and reverse it. Um, and that, that was kind of my understanding of Bitcoin and why it was uh, worth something because obviously gold, you can't just like erase gold, but is, is can Bitcoin be taken to a point where it can be erased in a sense uh, due to bad management of the consensus? I, it can't be erased. What it can be is abandoned. Um, if the community doesn't like it in its current form, that, and what would likely happen in that's, the, that... That makes the sense, the, abandoned. Yeah, that, because yeah it's ab gonna abandoned, be is, abandoned would be the correct word. If the Bitcoin protocol became such a, a stalemate uh, of, of some way or another, then, th and it, it just, it kind of, it got, it got bogged down in, in its, in its decentralized bureaucracy, 
then, it, I mean, it is possible, and this is the argument that Mike is making, that it is possible that kind of development comes to a standstill, it stops progressing and stops getting better and better and better and being able to handle larger and larger volumes as people want it more and more, then it could be a situation where people do abandon it eventually. That is a, a possibility, but a, a very unlikely very one. So, Max, and even if, what, what and even, it, if it, and even if it did happen, it might be, you know, that people can, it's an open source code, you have to remember. So, the people who are abandoning it could simply abandon it for Bitcoin 2.0 and make the change they want. So it's being being abandoned fully is pretty unlikely. So who has the keys to the changes? I mean, you talked about it being millions of people. It's a consensus, but exactly where where is that connection to who can change uh, Bitcoin? Okay, so there's a there's a few components here. So being an open source project, the the, the project is stored at and uh, there are, I believe, four programmers who have um, right access to that. And so they've been kind of entrusted by the community with that. But that's not really where the power is because, again, that project can be copy and pasted to another GitHub repository and different people can, can manage it. The real um, power, I would argue, comes with the, the miners. And for the, for, if you don't know what a miner is, a miner are the, the, the worker horses that um, maintain the network. When you make a transaction, if I, if I pay you a dollar in Bitcoin right now, what we do is we broadcast an encrypted message to the universe. And miners are all over the world. Their hardware turned on listening for all of the transactions. They listen for all of the transactions. They gather them in, in a, and put them in a block. And then they publish that block to the blockchain. And there's millions of miners competing against each other to be the one to do that uh, so that they get what is called a, a block reward, which is how new Bitcoins come into existence. That's how that happens. Now, why the power, a large amount of that power is um, vested at the miners is that so far what we've seen in the past is as changes and protocol changes come up, then it's the, it's the miners who kind of... They they upgrade their hardware, it's not their hardware, they upgrade their software and they accept the changes to the Bitcoin protocol and they all start doing, um, they all start, uh, what's called mining, they all start trying to solve those blocks uh, with the new protocol. If, and here's where the consensus works. Now, now, anybody can be a miner. All you need to do is go and buy, you can turn your computer on, although that would be very costly and not very good. Yeah, there's now specialized equipment which does it. Anyone can go and buy a, a mining rig for $1,000 to dollars dollars and you plug it into your wall at home and you start mining and you you are now it's just you are now one of the people out there contributing to the protocol and mining uh, and keeping the bitcoin network safe and prosperous and whatever else so it's very open anybody can do it who chooses to go and buy the hardware to do it actively all of those people with all of that mining power basically if more than 50 percent of those people start uh, up doing an upgrade then what happens is that the other 49% are basically forced to follow suit because or else they'll just they, they effectively get kicked, they're kicked out of the system. The system splits and the one with the, the most amount of hashing power, the most amount of computer power behind it, that becomes the dominant Bitcoin blockchain and everything else gets forgotten. That's how the system is designed. So up until now, we've seen how the vast majority of people, um, when, when there's a change, it happens very smoothly, there's a huge announcement, everyone knows it's for the benefit, benefit of uh, Bitcoin, and they just go ahead and do the upgrades. This time around, a large number of miners are being holdouts and saying, no, we're not upgrading. And we, we haven't reached that 50% consensus. And therefore, all of the people who want to change aren't, aren't, aren't willing to do so, obviously, because they'll be on the, the split that gets kicked out. And so I hope that answers your question. That is, the, that is where the majority of the power in this conversation starts. Anybody can do it. You just have to go and buy yourself a mining hardware rig. That was it. That's why it's extremely decentralized. But um, but but that's the challenge. Yeah, and it's controlled by millions of people. So it, it's not controlled by a, a few people, but a, a lot of people. And that that's another thing that makes it safe. That's what I'm gathering from you. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Max, in, in conclusion here, uh, what are your like ultimate thoughts on Bitcoin? I mean, obviously, it's really difficult for Bitcoin to be replaced because of the amount of infrastructure that is being built around it and the amount of people that are adopting it. What are your thoughts on where we could see Bitcoin in the next year to five years? 
Real wild man. If, uh, if, <laughs> if I knew the answer to that one, I'd be a rich man. Oh, I, I know. It's tough. I'm just curious. I mean, are you bullish on it? Is it something that you think is going to continue to grow? Or could something else come and, and just replace it? Like you, like you said, Bitcoin 2.0. Are, are you confident in Bitcoin? I, uh, no, I, I am back. I am confident in Bitcoin. Uh, I think this particular challenge will be overcome um, relatively easily. I will. Let me expand. I'll, I'll have, I want to have a different take on uh, an analogy that might be useful for your listeners as to why uh, Mike's concerns with the Bitcoin protocol. I've actually been saying it for a lot longer than he has. Um, the way I, I like this analogy, if there was a nightclub out there, we would expect that, you know, that normally the nightclub owner owns the building, he sets the drink prices, he hires the DJ, he sets the wages for all the staff, and he does it all because he wants, to, he wants the nightclub to succeed and make as most amount of money possible. And he's the decision maker. Now, he hires a security guard, and the security guard does what he says, because the security guard secures the nightclub and keeps it safe, but the, um, it's the, the person who owns the nightclub is the person who actually has all the power. Bitcoin, in my opinion, does have, it's a, if you designed it again, you would do it a little bit differently, I think. Because what I think Bitcoin is, is the bouncer at the nightclub has all the decision-making power. So mm. the analogy for this is that the miners are the security for the network and they hold the, the power. Now, usually, 99 times out of 100, the bouncers also want you know, the, the, the nightclub to prosper. They want, you know, people lining up down the street trying to get in so they get the most amount of tips. So they want the nightclub to be as popular as possible. So nine times out of 10, the decisions the bouncer will make and the decisions that the guy who owns the nightclub make, if they have the same skill set, are going to be the same thing. But every now and again, a decision is going to come up whereby the miners, um, out of uh, self-interest, they and one of those things obviously is what should the bouncers be paid? Um, the miners are going to have a different opinion to the nightclub owner as to how the nightclub should be run. And there's a slight misalignment of um, priorities and what they're advocating for. And I think this is one of those situations whereby the, the problem is, is that the, the miners shouldn't really be ones who decide whether or not the protocol should change. It should be one Bitcoin, one vote, or more accurately, one Satoshi, one vote. And the people who actually own Bitcoin should decide on the future of Bitcoin. That is how I think it, with the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of the Bitcoin experiment, I think that's what should have happened and what should have been done. And that's not what happened. So I just want to put that out there that I think that there's a valid concern and room for improvement there on the Bitcoin protocol. Back to your question, what do I think of Bitcoin? I am excited about Bitcoin. In fact, there's an event happening uh, this year in June, which I think is going to be really, really significant. Um, it's called the, the Bitcoin um, block, sorry, the, the block reward halving. What that means is the way it's something written into Bitcoin, something that cannot be changed, is that every four years, the number of Bitcoins that are released into the wild uh, cuts down by half. So for the first four years, Every 10 minutes, 50 new Bitcoins came into existence and, and entered the world. And then that halved. And then, uh, so then 25 Bitcoins came into the world every 10 minutes. And that second four-year period um, ends on, in, on around a, in, sometime in June, if my memory serves, of this year. And what that basically is, that's the rate of inflation. Now, it's not, it's not organized by you know, men in suits the discovery week. It was written and into open source software and cast in stone. So six years, seven years ago, right? So we all know what the rate of inflation. We all know that the rate of inflation is going to be cut in half every four years. So everybody knows what's going on. Market participants are all equal, but nonetheless, right now, if the price is let's say stay stays stable at around about four hundred dollars, what that means is that the number, the amount of new interest pouring into Bitcoin every single day, is equal to the amount that the that Bitcoin um, is being inflated. The amount that the supply of Bitcoin is going up. As a, as a loose principle, that is accurate. And what's going to happen in sort of six months' time is that, that um, the, the rate of inflation is going to be chopped in half. Mm. And so I think what you're going to find is that later on this year, you're going to see Bitcoin see all time, uh, new all-time highs as the, the demand pressure just starts to eclipse the supply pressure. And we're going to see um, Bitcoin go to a whole new level, which I think is going to really wake up the whole world because Bitcoin's price, which for the vast majority of people is its most interesting component, it's kind of been slipping and being boring for the last two years. And it's about to go, I think it's about to go ballistic. Now, the counter argument to that is 
because everybody knows this has been been um, this is the case. Everybody knows this is going to happen as of seven years ago. It's already priced into the market. And that's certainly a valid argument. And I think uh, a lot of people, certainly a lot of people have priced it into the market. But I also think there's a lot of people who have not and don't understand the ramifications of that. And that's why I think I'm, I'm really bullish on Bitcoin over the next 12 months. Well, the last it time it happened, it, it made a big move as well. Huge move. I'll give you a little history of that so you understand the timeline. The, har- the last halving occurred, uh, I think, in November, late November 2012. The price was about eleven dollars. Uh, by April of the next year, so just five months later, the price went from eleven to two hundred and sixty-six dollars, and then crashed back down to a hundred and sort of lingered at a hundred for six months. So I think there'll be a similar, you know, the the the, the what what my kind of argument from that is is that the price went from ten dollars to a hundred. And because it happened so quickly and greed and fear and markets and doing everything they do, people got all excited. There was a, there was a bubble and the bubble popped. So the real move was from $10 to $100. Because of the bubble, it was from $10 to $266 down to $100. And I think we'll see something similar. Um, some kind of huge bubble, huge euphoria. The media will get involved. All of a sudden, it'll be in the news again. All these people who heard Bitcoin once or twice but never took any action are like, oh, my God, I missed the first bubble. I missed the second bubble. I missed the third bubble. I'm not going to miss this bubble. And they're going to get involved in the, in the fourth bubble, and they're going to generate another bubble. And it will have another crash, and that crash will be higher than its current all-time high. Um, and I, that, that's how I kind of think it will play out. I, you know, and I, I know I said this was going to be the end, but uh, Bitcoin went from the hundred dollar range up into the four hundred dollar range, and uh, w- w- just recently, not in the last few months. Why? Uh, what What are your thoughts on why that happened? Was there something sin- significant that happened in that time? I'm not sure. No, th- there was nothing major. Um, I would. It's certainly possible. That it's a it's or it's a little bit of pre running from this uh, concept of the blockchain uh, the block reward halving already, and I, I do expect there to be some front running on that. So it's a possibility it was that there was um, I think there was some there was a lot of, there was some tools came out. We saw a lot of volume come through from China and Russia um, over different periods there, and so. All these things just happen. New technology comes out, new tools come out, governments change laws, new things happen. There's a greater threat to the economy. People, pers- I think election years are quite, there's a lot of fear mongering around election years. And so uh, I think you're going to see, it's another reason why I'm really bullish of Bitcoin. Thanks to this election year, there's going to be people talking about how bad the economy is, how you, whatever you do, don't vote for that guy, vote for me. And people are going to start saying, oh, you know, the, 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 it's going to be re-emphasized that just how perilous our current banking system is in our current economy. And uh, finding out about a solution outside of that is going to be advantageous. So all of those kind of things kind of play into the mix. And I don't think it was any one thing in particular this time around. It was just kind of a few different things around the world happening, which, which um, sort of raised the price a bit. Max, I, I really do appreciate you coming on the show and, and chatting Bitcoin with our audience here. If people want to learn more about you and reach out to you, uh, where would they go and what would they find? Uh, yeah, so I'm known on Twitter and uh, YouTube as Contrarian Dude. Uh, so you can find me at Twitter at Contrarian Dude and uh, just search for Contrarian Dude in YouTube. You will find me quick smart. Max Wright, everyone. Max, thanks f- for coming on the show with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.